there is a familiar tune, an old favorite called Listen to the Mockingbird. Yes, and I say to you, when you hear the story about that song, and about this little ferry boat, and about San Diego, you'll never be able to think of Listen to the Mockingbird the same way again. We go to a place of strange sounds and high-tech super-secret communications in a bygone time, the where and the why. And if you've been to Borrego Springs, you know these metal monsters that dot the desert landscape. But have you ever wondered, who did this? Why? And if you think there's a lot of them here, oh, just wait till you see where they came from. Along with some quite wonderful pictures that you've sent in, and more stories, too, all of them true, about San Diego. Ken Kramer's About San Diego, the history and people of the area we call home. Here's Ken Kramer. It is good to see you again for another of our shows about San Diego. Our program, if you've seen us before you know, is a collection of tidbits, things we see or come across every day, and we find that there's a story behind them, and it's just a lot of fun to discover these things. I will tell you that I got a couple of your questions about this first one, and here we go. Traveling the streets of San Diego, you get familiar with them, so here's one, see if you know, where is Underpass Street? Pops up online every once in a while. Here, for example, a couple of houses listed on Underpass Street. Well, you find interesting names in a part of Mira Mesa, galaxies like Andromeda, and the constellations abound, and signs of the zodiac, Capricorn and Libra. It's said that someone in the developer's family had a fascination with astronomy. In Point Loma, drive northeast up Rosecrans, it's an A to Z alphabetical array of authors, from English essayist Joseph Addison and poet Lord Byron through D, E, and F, to the Greek philosopher Xenophon, who was born in 430 BC, so he's the X, then novelist Charlotte Mary Yong, and French novelist Emile Zola, before the A's start up again. Also alphabetical, in the very heart of our city, streets named for trees and vines beginning with ash, beech, and cedar, through S for spruce, T for thorn, and U for upas. Now, can I just say that upas always sort of threw me because, and I have to admit something here, I didn't exactly know what a upas was. Oh, well, I knew it had to be a tree or something because that's what all the streets here are named for, but here you go, here's a upas. It's a tropical tree from Asia that is surrounded by fearsome myth. Now, it's true that the juice and bark of a upas tree produces a very toxic chemical, and arrows that were dipped in it were deadly, but the story didn't stop there. No, it was said that the upas tree itself exhaled a poison that brought death to everything and everybody within a 15-mile radius. It isn't true, of course. There's actually a Christmas story called the upas tree, and here in San Diego, one more little oddity about upas street. Those letters, U-P-A-S, when some computerized maps see those letters together, they think it's an abbreviation for underpass. So if sometime you come across an address on that mysterious underpass street, save yourself some time searching for it and just remember this story about San Diego. <laughs> Truthfully, I had no idea about Upas, let alone Underpass, but there you go, something learned about San Diego. All right, another question. Have you ever had a situation where a song gets into your head, you know, and it just keeps going round and round and you can't get it out of your mind, especially if you're someplace where it keeps getting played over and over again and you can't get away from it? Well, that's exactly what happened one time in our history, and you know, it drove one man nearly crazy. Let's go to the Maritime Museum of San Diego and the steam ferry Berkeley along the waterfront and we're going to go aboard past a lot of the people and exhibits to the upper deck where there is a piano, which is very handy because it's exactly what we need to tell this story. Oh, and we need somebody to play a simple little melody too. Jim Boydston, a docent at the museum, volunteered. Okay. Recognize it? It's a song that goes back to 1858, wildly popular, was said to be a favorite of President Abraham Lincoln. It's called Listen to the Mockingbird. Do you know it? Mm -hmm. 
Maybe you remember it from the Heckle and Jekyll cartoons that came along a century later. They were always playing Listen to the Mockingbird. Okay, so that's Listen to the Mockingbird. Now, I want to show you something. This is the only known picture of a little San Diego ferry boat called the Roseville from the 1880s. It was a cute little boat, very adorable. But it was a very attractive little vessel, probably about 60 feet long. And I would guess that it could take upwards of 20, maybe 30 passengers on a good day. Kevin Sheehan is one of the curators of the Maritime Museum. He showed us a model of the Roseville, which used to ferry passengers from what is today the Broadway Pier across the bay to the community of Roseville on Point Loma. Named for its founder and developer, Louis Rose, there was a pier there and some new houses. Roseville was an, the name on everyone's lips. It was one of the places you wanted to go and, and be seen at. So when you rode the little boat with that same name, Roseville, it was a first-class experience. Lamps deeply upholstered, chairs. And look, can you see in there in this model? That's a piano. Yes, there was a piano on board. There's a piano, the famous Roseville piano. And as you were going over, you could hear all the latest tunes being played by the pianist. Very nice, right? Back and forth across the bay on the Roseville with its piano and piano player. But at one point, apparently, there was one pianist who could basically only play one song, and that was Listen to the Mockingbird. So that's all he played over and over and over again. I wish we were out of here. And so the engineer, the guy who was down in the engine room, that was all he heard day in, day out. And he gave an ultimatum to the owners of the, of the boat, saying, either you find a new pianist or you find a new engineer. Well, you can imagine what happened. The pianist was fired, the engineer continued, and the boat went silent. And that might be where the story ends. That boat, the Roseville, it's long gone and mostly forgotten, except for one thing, the Roseville piano, the very one on which Listen to the Mockingbird was played to distraction. It was saved and donated and is on board the Berkeley today. When you see it, or if you ever hear that old song, here's hoping you remember the Roseville and this story about San Diego. That thing where a song gets stuck in your head and won't go away for days and weeks, it can be a real problem. Psychologists who have studied this say, if it happens to you, here's what you should do. Go find the song online or someplace, play it all the way through, and then immediately engage in a cognitively engrossing activity, something that challenges your brain, like doing a crossword or watching About San Diego, an option which nobody on that boat had back then, sad to say. Do go with me now on a little journey, okay? We're off to a setting that by its very nature fires up the imagination and brings to life all kinds of visions, strange things, you know? And see them we shall, but we're going to take it a step beyond because it's not enough to just see what countless numbers of people have seen over the years. We were curious to know, where's this coming from? What's this about? And if you're ready, let's see what we can discover. So it's the desert. Sun-baked, nothing but sand and wind-blown scrub brush, nobody around, desert. And I'm walking, see, and I look there. Something, I think. Nah, couldn't be. Out here? Closer look, and oh, it's real. Real. Metal. And it's not alone. No, there are dozens of them in ones and twos spread out over acres of the desert, as if challenging the monsoon clouds. They seem oddly at home here, unaffected by blowing sand and scorching heat. They are these most improbable, unlikely metal sculptures. More than 130 of them now, including a 350-foot dragon serpent undulating across the desert, just this one so big that a road runs right through it. You know if you live in Borrego or have visited or like so many of us have seen them out here off of Borrego Springs Road around an area called Galeta Meadows. But maybe you've wondered, how did this ever happen? Who did this? 
And that's where we're going to pick up the story because there was a man, the late Dennis Avery, a whip-smart attorney, Harley Davidson writer, and heir to the Avery sticky label fortune. You know those Avery peel-off labels? Well, that was his family, and he owned this land out here in Borrego Springs on which he imagined there could be public art, replicas of prehistoric creatures and whimsical creations on a giant scale. But who could do it? He had to find the right person to do it, a sculptor, really talented, but with a whimsical, happy, playful side. Well, we wanted to find him too, so road trip. An hour's drive from Borrego, about 18 miles east of Temecula, in fact, along Highway 79, suddenly look. More of these metal sculptures alongside the road there, and another one, and a sign. Enjoy the view. Art by Ricardo Braceda. And then suddenly on the north side of the road, like a Christmas tree lot, is row after row of fantastical creations from Ricardo Braceda. He's the guy who did all those Borrego sculptures and who has welded and hammered out in sheet metal, maybe a couple of hundred more here in Aguanga, California. Hey, look at all, all I have, you know. I have marlins, horses, cows, donkeys, T-Rexes, rams, octopuses. One thing about Ricardo, some of his creatures may be frightening and intimidating, but that's not him at all. He'll never be the somber artist brooding over life. This whole metal sculpture thing, he's having the time of his life. Oh, it's, it's fun. It's more than fun. It's a passion. Born in Durango, Mexico, this, all of this started when his daughter asked him if he could make a life-size dinosaur. He did, and it was the first of many. Soon there were fans who started following him and his work. He meets more of them here every day. He calls that his best pay. The best pay for an artist is when people like what you do, when people enjoy what you do, when people feel what you do. But he's also become quite the success. He's sold pieces to people who come from as far away as China to see his work. This place, this sort of outdoor showroom, is where this genuinely genial genius is at his happiest. I have many people come over and enjoying and smiling, and I mean, it's on and on every day, like, a new day. Who are you going to meet today? What are you going to say? He's been commissioned to do giant works throughout Southern California. His biggest, that serpent in Borrego Springs. How did he think of it? Did the inspiration come from a dragon book or a picture? Well, the dragon, I make it myself out of my head. It's not dragons and no books nowhere. I make that dragon in my head. Every piece, every one of them has its own personality, Ricardo says very detail-oriented. Just look at this one, horses and wagon, like they would last forever out here in the elements, and they just might. The cactus he created nearby surely will. But his work also seems to have so much of his sense of fun. That's right, it's what I do. I make people smile. I make people happy. An art critic might find hidden meanings in Ricardo's fantastical sculptures. He's changed careers, suffered a debilitating construction injury, and sold cowboy boots before he ever discovered he could do this. And now? It's better than the, the San Diego Sioux. Well, well, and it's something else, I think. It's inspiring. These pieces of art here and scattered across the desert are an inspiration to think large, think fearlessly. Focus on something, make it happen. Do it, just do it. And most of all, most of all, have fun. Not too long ago, a storm, one of those summer storms that can come up just like that and blow things around. Well, one of those came blasting through Aguanga, where he does his work and where you saw all those pieces that he displays. And it blew them over and into one another in this crash and tangle of metal. And a more fragile artist might have been devastated, but he drew on this inner strength that I think you see in some of those strong images he fashions. Anyway, he set them right back up and made repairs, and he goes on creating. It is true that often we can miss things that are right under our feet, and this next story is about just that kind of thing. 
If you don't know what to look for, you'll miss some of these things, and who could blame you? We live in a modern, busy world where this kind of thing can easily be overlooked. But when you know the story, I don't know if it's possible to think of these spots in the same way again, because they have their own history, and that history is fascinating, even if it's not obvious. Show you what I mean. Okay, I want to show you something in San Marcos on South Rancho Santa Fe Road. Thousands of cars zipping by this intersection with Meadowlark Ranch Road every day, and almost nobody knows what they're driving right past. Just a little flat spot right in the median, see it? You wouldn't notice it if you were driving. So what is it? Well, you know in Old Town, San Diego, there was El Campo Santo, a Catholic cemetery that dates back to 1849, just a small yard today, but it used to be bigger before Old Town grew and San Diego Avenue was paved, and there are bodies still right under what is now the sidewalk in the street. A plaque shows where they are, and there are little metal grave markers that most people don't notice or know that they're driving or walking right over an old grave. And you probably know, same thing in Mission Hills, Pioneer Park, grass and trees, place for picnics, there's a playground, it's really nice, and it's right over as many as 4,000 graves. Few headstones too, off to one side if you know where to look. Used to be this was Calvary Cemetery from 1875 into the 1950s, and yes, the bodies are still there, six feet under what is now a public park. Which brings us back here to San Marcos, where once was the Meadowlark Pioneer Cemetery, dating back to about 1900. It was small, only about seven graves, and when traffic engineers wanted to widen Rancho Santa Fe Road, it was thought, well, we'll just dig up and move the graves to another cemetery, and the families said no. So they weren't moved. The road was built around the graves instead, and there they are in the median strip now, marked by a cross and a plaque, and also on the sidewalk is a monument which is easier and safer to see, that pays tribute to those who, even though they're out there in the middle of a busy roadway, rest in peace. Their graves among the things undisturbed and mostly unnoticed about San Diego. I just love stories like that, that give us a different look at things we might see every day and now might never see the same way again. Our next stop is kind of like that too. Let me set the scene. Imagine walking into a place that was just a hub of the very latest in communications technology some years ago. Things are buzzing and beeping all around, sending and receiving coded messages, all very high tech in a somewhat earlier time. In here, it's like something from a science fiction story. What is this? An outer limits place that for almost 50 years was top security. You couldn't just walk in here and take pictures. Up until the early 1990s, it was all part of the most sophisticated communication center you could imagine. If something was going on nearby or anywhere in the world, really, all these data burps and bleeps and Morse code beeps had a purpose. They helped keep everyone here and around the world safe. Starting in 1945 and through the decades thereafter, the communication that came in and out of here was not just security and life critical, it was crucial to the war effort in the days after World War II and then Vietnam and Desert Storm. This was high intensity real-time drama and every one of the thousands upon crazy thousands of switches, push buttons and meters here had to be maintained and understood they had to work. Time and technology has changed. This place isn't state-of-the-art or top secret anymore. In fact, it's just for display today. Anybody can come in and see and wonder at it. Now, no communication actually comes through here anymore, except every now and then. CQ, CQ, CQ. This is NI6IW, November India 680 Whiskey. These are ham radio operators who gather here on Saturdays, once a month or so, to bring this place back to life. Sending and receiving voice, data, and Morse code messages. For a few hours, it's once again tuned into the world. And for me, the chance to click and beep out some Morse code from a very historic radio room. That's something that doesn't happen every day. That's it. 
Uh, his name was Fred, and he was near Seattle. There's a preservation of history here, of equipment, dials, switches, teletypes, of the way things used to be. But it's more than that, because this whole communications area is part, and I would argue a big part, of the Midway. Honored and lovingly maintained as an aircraft carrier museum on our waterfront by volunteers and docents, some of whom served aboard her, and who I imagine remember well these sights and sounds in a place now cherished and preserved about San Diego. Very nice. Thank you to the folks at Midway for showing us around and letting me do a little Morse code. They are such a fun group dedicated to keeping the signals coming and going from that carrier, even as she is now a permanent fixture on San Diego Bay. Okay, time now to see what you have sent in. This is your part of the program. Photos and memories about San Diego from you, and we do thank you for them. We always say just send or email copies of those photos of San Diego in the old days and nothing alive, liquid or flammable, please, as we see what about San Diego you've sent in this time. Carlsbad, along Carlsbad Boulevard, just south of Solomar Drive, Brandon Miles wants to know, what's this? A block with the letter C on it. Here's another one from Jean Villard, Imperial Beach, near Palm Avenue and 7th. Well, they are right-of-way markers. If you see one, you're on the edge of an old California State Highway right-of-way, usually about 50 or 100 feet from the center line of the roadway. The C points to where the road is or used to be. Bethany Gilbert Nodurft wonders, what is this tower in Coronado just before you go over the bridge to San Diego? Well, we checked. Historian Joe Dittler says it was part of a fresh air filtration system for the now abandoned toll booths so the workers wouldn't get sick from exhaust fumes. I'm in the social register. I'm in the blue book too. Our story on the life and career of Johnny Downs, movie star who then went to television and became a longtime San Diego TV kid show host. Remember Johnny Downs? Well, it brought a couple of memories. From Glenn E. Sheets, howdy, 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 be sure to drink your Golden Arrow Dairy Milk now. Autograph, too. And another one, Town Talk Enriched White Bread, Johnny's favorite, Teresa Arbio Barth of Cardiff by the Sea. Thank you. And for this, Drinking in the Sky, 1950s and 60s, the El Cortez Sky Room was so elegant, such a fashionable go to spot for bon vivants. A pastel postcard panorama for those who could only imagine taking the glass elevator to the top of the world at the El Cortez. Ah, what a thing. The very best San Diego had to offer, and it was exquisite. Story we did about the Storm of Storms, 1926, which heavily damaged Mission Beach and led to the construction of the seawall. Look at this picture from 1939 taken by Edward C. Homerud, wave crashing against the seawall. Can you believe it? Thanks to Owen Western, and for this one too, from 1988. Remember our movie-making story, films shot in San Diego? Vicky Estrada sent this picture of the children's pool in La Jolla during filming of the Stuntman movie in the late 1970s. silent movie made in Lakeside, Durbin Potter says sitting on the left there, that's his great-grandfather Charlie. A couple of fun things, Hillcrest, the Delhi Lama. Laura Sullivan, the owner, says one day a woman sent a picture from 1936, said her granddad owned the place back then and she worked at the soda fountain. Thank you to Gary Mitrovich for 4th of July postcard 1911. Spent the holiday with Frank and Cora, the ideal climate, love from grace, but notice the postmark, Terralta. Where's Terralta, California? Well, Terralta eventually became part of the city of East San Diego. Yes, it was a city on its own, separate police department and everything. East San Diego, by the way, became what we know today as City Heights. Nancy Peterson Rosario says, here are my uncles, Walter and Lawrence Oakland, in a 1928 photo, a keepsake the family has held on to for generations. And here she is, sun shining it in a stylish Mercury 8. 
And finally, Adrian de Cuardo Waddell says big fan of the show is her golden retriever, Romeo. So hi, Romeo. And thanks to all for the memories about San Diego. And that's it for this time in this episode of About San Diego Fun Show this week. If you want to see these stories again or learn more about them, just go to our webpage at KenKramerTV.com and click on Watch or Learn More. We're also on Facebook at Ken Kramer's About San Diego. We'd love to have you join the conversation there. We will see you next time, whatever your species. Until then, and as always, I'm Ken Kramer. Thank you for watching and for caring about San Diego. Support for this program comes from the KPBS Explore Local Content Fund, supporting new ideas and programs for San Diego.